Welcome to From the Front Lines, Surgeons' Voices for the American College Surgeons Bulletin Brief. We're going to continue our conversations about the exciting, innovative, virtual annual clinical congress today with Dr. Sharmila Desanaki, Chief of Surgery at Texas Tech and a Board of Governors representative to the ACS Program Committee. Welcome, Sharmila. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start out, if we might, please, talking about some of the aspects of the program relating to trauma. If you could maybe describe some of the key sessions and why surgeons should tune into them. Absolutely. So as we mentioned just a second ago when we were talking offline, the nice thing and the, both the challenge and the good thing with ACS Clinical Congress is how large it is. And fortunately, though, a lot of the trauma sessions are clustered. I'll tell you, the program committee kind of put a lot of thought and the ACS staff have worked closely into how this is arranged. So a lot of the trauma sessions that I'm gonna talk about actually happen on one day, which is October 6th, which is I believe the Tuesday of the session. So it's sort of held together by sort of the trauma highlight of every year, which is the Scudder Oration, which happens at one o'clock. And I'm sure that's going to be wonderful. I do need to say the Scudder Oration always coincides with the Olga Jonasson lecture. And this year we can watch both because they're gonna be available asynchronously till December. So that's fabulous for me personally, it's always hard to choose. Um, but after that, we really cover a wide range of things. So there are things from the prevention aspect. So there's a session on firearm uh, injury prevention strategies as an update on that. As you know, under Dr. Ronnie Stewart's leadership, we've done a lot of work on that in the last few years. So there's gonna be an update on that. Dr. Barbara Bass really promoted intimate partner violence being something we needed to focus on. And so there's actually a session on the impact of the COVID pandemic on intimate partner violence. And I will tell you, I personally have definitely seen an uptick and speaking to my trauma colleagues, most of us are seeing that across the country as people are stressed and kind of put together in lockdown situations Unfortunately, there's an increased incidence of interpersonal conflict, violence, firearm injuries, and deaths. So uh, we'll be talking about that. That's very topical. There are sessions on difficult trauma exposures. I think this is something that's very basic for trauma surgery, but if you're not doing it all day, every day, I think it could be a bit challenging. And on those same lines, there's things about management of the mangled extremity and also the acute limb ischemia, which may not be exactly trauma, but very much related to it. And all of that is happening on October 6th. And I think for rural surgeons, I'm also on the advisory council of rural surgery. I think a lot of my rural colleagues deal with a lot of trauma because that's who's there for these emergencies. And so learning how to get those exposures would be really good. Um, and then there's some discussions on traumatic brain injury. Uh, there's one on October 5th. And finally, one on soft tissue injuries on uh, October 6th as well. I'm also a burn surgeon. A lot of trauma surgeons cover a little bit of burn. And there is a session on October 5th on burn surgery for the non-burn center. And I think that's gonna be very valuable too. Thank you. Certainly sound like a lot of very exciting information packed sessions uh, relevant to many, many people, as you say, general surgeons, rural surgeons, trauma and burn surgeons. There are some components of the program that are agnostic, if you will, to specialty, more or less how the program runs, the fact that things are recorded and then they're going to be available, as you say, asynchronously. And perhaps you could describe to us for, for all surgeons, not just trauma and burn, how this program is going to benefit surgeons. Absolutely. So um, I think it is very well balanced in terms of clinical content. It is heavy on clinical content. Um, it is also bringing in the latest research because on October 3rd and 4th, the sort of weekend days when before Congress sort of formally gets going, it's scientific forum sessions, which is people presenting their research. So you've got sort of latest things not even yet published and then you've got the panel sessions where experts from around the country are discussing various things. And for example, on the final day, October 7th, we have the hot topics in general surgery, hot topics in surgical oncology and hot topics in emergency general surgery. I mean, that covers a huge gamut and is telling you what the most pertinent issues are. These are always great sessions when they're live, they're fabulous. And I think they're gonna be great when they're recorded too. But I think that the fact that we can now watch all of them, you don't have to pick and choose. You don't only have to know oncology or trauma. You can watch both. I think that's going to be hugely beneficial and having that available. I'm really hoping, Steve, that this is something we continue year after year because it's always been a problem at Congress, what to pick and choose and why not have it all. Very, very good point. Well stated. For what period of time will the educational content remain available? 
So it's going to be available for everyone until December. So at any time you can watch the sessions you really want to live. Um, some sessions are live, some are pre-recorded, but you can watch them as billed on the channel, but then you can go back and watch at any time all the way till December. So that's a good solid three months that you have full-time access. After that, if you want access to those sessions, uh, the webcast will be available as it always is every year. You already alluded to the fact that uh, you hope some of these innovations will remain in future Clinical Congress years. Knowing the way the ACS works, the program committee, I'm sure, is already busy making at least a template for 2021. Are aspects, if you're at liberty to say, are aspects of virtual programs being considered for 2021? Absolutely. I do not see any scenario, Steve, in which we won't have a virtual component. Uh, for 2021. And I will say the program committee is very much trying to think on their feet. Um, I know this has been a gargantuan task for the staff and the members and all the surgeons who are participating. I mean, every speaker is really doing yeoman's effort to get this together. Converting the largest surgical conference in the world onto online is no easy task. But now that we've done this really difficult job in 2020, I think we can keep the best parts for 2021 and future. And I think definitely having this ability for people to attend sessions that are clashing and conflicting and see them all is something we need to retain. I mean, we should have it all. That's why we're the ACS. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your time and I greatly appreciate all the work that you've done, all of, as you say, the difficult yeoman's work for the program committee, setting the foundation for transforming, quickly transforming and expertly transforming the world's largest surgical Congress into a virtual platform. On behalf of all of the fellows, thanks for your time today and thanks for all you've done with the program committee. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate being on.